This episode is sponsored by Newbie Remote Conf. Newbie Remote Conf is a two-day completely virtual conference hosted by none other than Charles Max Wood. If travel expenses are an issue or you just can't afford to be away from home for two days, then join us. It's virtual. This conference is focused on people who are new to programming who want to learn what the pros know or just get a leg up in getting a job and getting into the programming community. We'll have speakers from all over the programming community to help you stay current and a Slack room where you can connect with speakers and other attendees in real time. We'll also have a live roundtable video chat for attendees and speakers, plus we'll provide the talk recordings to you within days of the conference. Early bird tickets are available for $150 until May 12th, and the call for proposals is open until April 28th. So come join us at newbieremoteconf.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another... It's both a my JS story and my Angular story since we're talking to Aaron Frost. How's it going, Frosty? Uh, good, man. How you doing? Doing all right. Um, now, you were a panelist on JavaScript Jabber, and then when we started up Adventures in Angular, you moved over to Adventures in Angular. So, um, yeah. Usually, I, I, I announce, hey, they were on this episode and that episode, but you've been on quite a few. Yes, I did JS Jabber for a while, and then you did Adventures in Angular. I did that for a while. I did both for a while, and then I kind of dropped off JS Jabber because I didn't have enough time for both. Yeah. And so I just did Adventures in Angular, and then I kind of, I've just kind of been hit and miss really, really random appearances on Adventures in Angular. So, so yeah, do you want to just uh, tell us really briefly, you know, where you're at now? Uh, in life and work, or what do you mean? Yeah, um, just because people haven't heard from you for a while, so, you know, just kind of give us a picture, you know, where you're at with life okay. and work and everything. Okay. So I am a principal engineer at Domo still, and I've been there for four years, and it's it's been a lot of fun. I work with some really cool guys, a lot of people that that you'll know, Dave Geddes, Merrick Christensen, people yeah. like that. Um, I'm still. We just had our fourth NG Conf, so as one of the organizers of that, that's always a big deal. And um, I have four kids now. My youngest is two years old. Oldest is eleven. Um, got a dog for Christmas. We named him Jack <laughs> Frost. Oh, nice. But, but yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. That's kind of where life is right now. Your wife wouldn't let you name one of the kids Jack Frost? No, no. no. <laughs> but it's a great dog name when your last name is Frost. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, we usually start off the show, um, you know, with a little bit of chit chat like we've done. And then we get into that first question, which is, how did you get into programming? Okay, so I was a loan officer and I was really bad at it. I did mortgages. And oh, wow. so I sucked. Like, there's really good loan officers and then there's people who are bad and I was one of the bad ones. <laughs> and so I, I needed to get a new career. So I went to work at this um, accounting support phone center where we, we did like phone support for accountants. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you had to do SQL. Well, I was outmanned as far as like brain power goes uh, with accounting. Everyone on my team was so much smarter than me, but the SQL was a thing I was good at. Like just immediately it was like speaking English. I was like, oh, this is really easy. So I quickly like kind of excelled at that. And then uh -huh. they were like, you should try out for QA. So I tried out for the QA team. I got on there. Um, in On the QA team, the automation uh, the UI automation made a lot of sense to me. So uh -huh. I wrote, I, I wrote more automation tests in like two weeks than the entire company had been able to build in its existence. So I was really, I, I excelled really quickly at automation and then I became a senior QA and then I did QA management for a while and then I went back to senior QA. And then I finally in 2010 jumped over to, to development full time from QA. And that's kind of been it um, since that's kind of everything it's kind of in the past. That's kind of when I met you. Mm -hmm. That's around the time when you and I met was around 2010 ish. I remember we were both speaking at Utah code camp. You did a quick presentation on how to build a URL shortener. Uh -huh. Do you remember that talk? No, I don't actually. I, yeah. You were like, Hey, here's with Ruby. Here's how you do a URL shortener. Like how you uh -huh. build your own custom. URL. Anyway, I was like, Oh, that's cool. And that, and yeah, so I knew a little bit of JavaScript and, and everyone was like, dude, you know, JavaScript, you must be really smart. So it was just, you know, that time when JavaScript was starting to turn, uh -huh. 
I just got into development right then and everyone kind of shoved me to the front of the line because I knew JavaScript. And yeah, well, so. during that period, I mean, you know, toward the end of the two, you know, uh, yeah, leading up to about 2010, I mean, most web developers hated dealing with JavaScript. It was yeah. all about the back end, all about the back end. And yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, oh, you want to do JavaScript? Here. Yeah, exactly. And I loved it. Like, I, the very first time I, like, I was, I remember the first night someone told me how to learn jQuery, and I was, like, mm-hmm. so pissed. I was like, I, I don't, I barely know this language. Why are you making me learn another one? Uh huh. And by the end of the first night, I was like, whoa, this language is so much better than all <laughs> the other languages I've ever learned. So I got really good at jQuery, and then I was like, well, I think I should learn JavaScript properly then. And I yeah. did, and, and I never looked back. I, I've been in love with it ever since I learned it. Awesome. Now, yeah. one of the reasons why I do this show, you know, the my JS story, my Angular story in particular, is because I want to kind of shine a light on, hey, no matter what your background is, you can get into this and learn this. You know, it, it doesn't take these geniuses that got a computer when they were five years old and, you know, whatever. And and that's that's where they're at now. And you, you've been recognized. You've been a GDE for Angular, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and, and things like that. And, you know, you, you came into this field relatively recently. Yeah. And it, it just, for me, it's, it's kind of this, Hey, look, you know, if you're out there, you're a loan officer and you're thinking, gee, I want to change careers. You can do it. Yeah, totally. You really can. When I started going to school to be a programmer, so I'm a college dropout, by the way, Uh I just had a, I had a, a specific salary in mind. Pro, uh, school was a means and end for me. Right. I needed to get a programming job so I could have this dollar amount annual salary. And once I hit that, I still kept going to school, kind of confused why I was still going. And then once I made it past that significantly, I I was like, yeah, I think I'm done. I I, I know how to I know how to teach myself now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop going. Between Stack Overflow and podcasts like the ones you do and YouTube, I had everything I needed. So I was able to teach myself from then on. But yeah, I, I wrote kind of going to your story. I wrote my first line of code when I was 27. I'm 37 now. So uh-huh. um, I didn't start like a lot of these really young geniuses that were surrounded by, you know, um, because how fast programming is growing. Most programmers are millennials. Yeah. And they're all really, so you've got, you're surrounded by all these really, really young genius kids that like, you're like, wow, I wish I was that responsible when I was that age. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't, I wasn't that responsible. I I didn't start to make good decisions like that till I was around 27 or so. So, so yeah. Yep. Well, and it's interesting too, you, you know, you mentioned that you're surrounded by new people, new programmers, younger people, and um, I, I listened to a talk or watched a talk on YouTube. I'll have to find the link for it. Um, but it was Uncle Bob Martin, and he was talking to a group of people about so- solid development principles. But mm-hmm. when he started out the talk, he started out by pointing out that um, every five years about um, the number of programmers in the world doubles. Yeah. And what, what that means is that um, half of the people in programming at, every, at any given time are new. They've been doing it for less than five years. That's yeah. right. And so, yeah. you know, yeah, it's it's just kind of interesting, that, you know, the point that you're making there, it, it really kind of drove that home to me. Yeah, you're surrounded by all these younger people or newer people. And yeah, mm-hmm. the, the majority of the, the industry has been programming for less than 10 and half of it's been programming for less than five. For less than five, yeah, exactly. It's It's humbling. I mean, I'm sure you've had the experience where... Uh, you run into a 23 year old kid who blows your mind and you're like, yeah. wow, I, I had no idea. Like mad props. It's humbling. Every, every time it happens and, and I love to see it. And, mm-hmm. uh, so it, it happens to me a lot. So yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that too comes down to just kind of the level of exposure that they've had and the way that technology shaped their, um, childhood in ways that it didn't shape mine. You know, cause yeah. I'm 37 also. So. You know, we, we were growing up around the same time. Um, I grew up here in Utah, and I'm assuming that you probably did too, but I, I don't know that. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, so my background is going to be different from theirs because I'm, you know, 10, 15, 20 years older than they are. 
And so yeah. they take a lot of things for granted and they just see things in a different way sometimes. Yeah, I remember <laughs> telling my my kids asked me what kind of games we had on our phones when I was a kid. And I was <laughs> like, dude, I had I was like four levels separated from games on phones. I'm like, back then, uh, games were only on Nintendos. Phones were uh-huh. only plugged into the wall. Like, oh yeah. Like it, you tried to explain it to them. Like, yeah, there was. I was so far removed from games on phones that that yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then you try and explain that the only fun thing you could do on the phone was either call grandma or crank call somebody. And yeah. now everybody has caller ID, so crank calling is kind of not a thing. It's totally busted. So how did you get, yeah, so you talked a little bit about how you got to JavaScript. Um, mm-hmm. What what was it about JavaScript that really got you excited about it? Because, I mean, you're talking about, you know, coming into it in an era where, yeah, I mean, most of the people I was talking to were in the Ruby community, and they were mm-hmm. all like, oh, we have to do JavaScript because we're on the web, but oh, oh. Yeah. So I got, here local in Utah, there's this company They're still around. They're not as growing as fast as they were, but they're called Kinetics. And Mm -hmm. Dr. Phil Winley, he's the owner. And what they were building at the time was a platform that you could build your browser extension on this platform. And then they would make your browser extension work on Firefox, IE, Safari, and Chrome. And I was like, "That's that's a pretty good deal. I can build one browser extension and it just runs anywhere. So I kind of got involved with their company and I had to learn their custom rules language called KRL kinetics rules language. And, and I was like, this is cool. And I I had never learned JavaScript and they were like, you have to learn jQuery to do some of this stuff. And I was like, good night, another freaking language. But I loved browser extensions because I could, I, they're so fun. If you've never done one, do one because you can take a really big site that's popular like Facebook and you can modify it or yep. like Twitter or Netflix or, you know, whatever you want. And you can make it be what you want it to be. Like you can tell the web, hey, web, do what I want you to do. Not not just experience it the way that like the default user experience. Mm-hmm. So they're like, hey, you got to learn jQuery. And so I was kind of forced into it. And it literally was just that first night. I was like, oh, I love this language. And um I, I just kind of stuck with jQuery for three or four months because it's pretty powerful. I mean, yep. especially when you consider that time, 2010, there weren't any frameworks. So you just did jQuery. That was kind of the thing. Well, and working in the DOM by yourself across all the browsers and stuff, that was a pain. That was a pain. And, and jQuery solved it. Yeah. So then I formalized on actual JavaScript and... um and I and I was like, man, this asynchronous thing is this functional based scripting language is it just fits in my head so much better than the classical Java or C sharp that I had always learned. If it, it just fits so much better in my head, and I felt so well equipped in a way I never did in Java or C sharp. So right. So yeah. I know that not a lot of developers can identify with that. They feel less equipped in JavaScript, but for me, it was the opposite. I felt very, very powerful from day one. I think a lot of that, though, just comes down to, you know, the way that you train your brain to think about programming. And so if you started out in JavaScript and really didn't branch off into too many of these other languages very deeply, it, it probably just fits in as this is programming paradigm. Like it's a natural programming paradigm. Most of the mm-hmm. time when I hear people complain about JavaScript, typically they're comparing it to whatever language they learned first or whatever language they have the most experience with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've had the same experience. So you get into JavaScript, jQuery, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. life is good, you're, you're mm-hmm. making whatever money you wanted to make. How do you get mm-hmm. to Angular? That's a good question. Um, I... I worked for a big local corporation in Utah and there was a, there's a lot of really powerful developers there okay. and the, and the JavaScript community was really strong in that corporation. And 
we were doing backbone as like generally like the, the, the JavaScript stack team for the whole organization, which there was about 500 programmers. There, there was one team that kind of prescribed the JavaScript stack and they were like, you'll use backbone. And then like knockout came out and Ember came out and Angular came out. And one day in passing, I just kind of elbowed the, uh, the, the stack team lead. I said, Hey dude, have you seen Angular? Like it's kind of cool. And it, it, I write way less code in it than I do with Backbone. Like, I can get a lot more done in a lot less code. And he was like, hey, this is Dave Geddes, for everyone who knows him, uh-huh. who's awesome. And he was like, dude, I think you should, sh- you should come work with me on this team, the stack team, and we'll push out any of it to everyone. And so we did. And we pushed it out there. And then we went to – we both hired on the same week at, at Domo. And they were on Backbone, and we started this big conversion to Angular. And so, yeah, that was kind of how we started in Angular was we were writing so much less code in it than Backbone that it just was a, an immediate no-brainer that, yeah, well, you, we'll move to this. Uh-huh. And now two-way data bindings like this swear word on in JavaScript, but back then it <laughs> wasn't a swear word. It was like, wow, there's so much like utility in this in this yeah. paradigm. So it was it was the the coolest newest thing and. And it actually did save a lot of code. So oh, it totally yeah. did. Yeah. Made a lot. And now, of now it's not great, but, but then it was amazing. And, and we totally recognized that at the time. And it was still a good decision looking back at it. It was still a great decision. So, so yeah. And then one day, my buddy Kip Lawrence, who I know you know, Charles, uh-huh. and, but I know not everyone on this, on this will know him, but he's kicked back in his chair and said, yo, we should go to an Angular conference. We're learning it. We're getting good at it. Maybe we should go uh-huh. to a conference. And I was like, that's a genius idea. We should go. So we Googled, you know, Angular conference, JavaScript Angular. We tried, you know, 15 different variations, and there weren't any. The best we could get were JavaScript conferences with one or two Angular talks. Uh-huh. And then at that point, I was like, okay, let's go back to work. But Kip was like, oi, we should make one. <laughs> and I was like, that sounds like a bad idea. Like, I I don't want to do that. But it turned out that it was actually a good idea. And I went to Google the next month and I, I was like, hey, if we do this, will you send a couple guys? And Brad was like, yeah, we'll send the whole team. And then that was when Kip and I, we were like, okay, let's get Joe Eames on board. Let's get Dave on board and let's make this thing a serious conference. And And, and it's been... That's kind of my story with Angular. That's so, amazing. That's the beginning. And then since then, I've really, like, because I work on a team with 60 front-end developers, and we're on one single-page app. So think about that. Uh-huh. 60 engineers on one single-page app. Yeah, you guys so, must hate your life. Well, it's not. We don't hate it. It has its own unique challenges. Yeah, I'm sure. there's, there's some benefits of doing it that way, too, but there's challenges that come with it. Yeah. But we have some serious performance things we have to focus on sometimes. Uh And so the last probably year and a half, two years, I've been focusing specifically around performance improvements in a gigantic SPA with Angular. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. When I say you must hate your life, I just can't imagine having to coordinate contributions from 60 people into a single app, especially given the way that Angular works. In a lot of cases, you're going to have several people relying on the same components and services. And if something doesn't play nicely, it's going to get ugly really fast. Yeah, it's there's actually um, an unexpected amount of sanity in the way we've got it working. Um, Sometimes the build will break, but it's rare. Sometimes someone will break your code, but it it doesn't happen every day. Uh A lot of us, we're working in our feature that doesn't touch anyone else. And so... So there's a, there's a surprising amount of sanity mm-hmm. in the way that we make it work. Right. And there's a lot of lazy loading going on right now. Like we basically lazy load everything that we possibly can in order to make the, the time to the first meaningful paint as, as, as slow as possible. So that's really cool. Yeah. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, being a GDE. How exactly mm-hmm. does that happen? Does somebody like at Google say, this guy's awesome, make him a GDE? Or Yeah, so that's how it used to happen. Now um, there's a GDE app. I'm trying to find it real quick. 
Um, yeah, there's an app that you just go to and you just nominate yourself and you have to put in then there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of things that go into being a GE. Um, there's a lot of really smart, like way smarter than the angular developers uh-huh. or just Chrome developers. Cause you don't have to be a GE only angular, right? You could be right. like Chrome or polymer or whatever. And, um, they're really, really smart. And you and I both know, it, but, there doesn't qualify you to be a GDE because a GDE is also like an evangelist. Right. And so they're going to ask you what blog posts you've written, you know, what's your stack overflow score uh, with regards to that, 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 that hashtag, whether it's Chrome dev tools or Chrome or Polymer or Angular or, or whatever Google related technology. And they're going to ask you what blog posts, what, conference presentations you've done, what books you've written, what um, uh, open source contributions you've done to the project, and all these things that, that would make you stand out among developers. Not just that you're an expert with the technology, but you also help evangelize right. and make it better for the community. So that's really what a GDE is. It's like a community leader in in the community, not so much just an absolute like brainiac with regards to the specific technology. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So I did a lot of conference talks and did some blog posts and I organized a big conference, NGConf and, and I did several things and then your team was like, let's get this guy nominated. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And then as far as uh, JavaScript Jabber, do you remember how you got to be on the show? Um, I, can't recall for certain, but I think it was either you or Joeen's that was like, we need another panelist. Frost, why don't you come fill in? So I filled in a couple times. Yeah. And then I think you guys formally said, hey, come uh, come be a panelist. Yeah, so. that's, that's typically how it works. We usually, I couldn't remember for sure, but yeah. yeah. We, so I, sh- I showed up a couple times and then I, I got on the, the email distro list. Uh-huh. And so I started showing up. Um, to the to the recordings every week. Yep. And then so. with Adventures in Angular, um, I know Joe came and talked to me about it. I think you did, and I think Merrick did, as far as starting the podcast. And it was funny because I remember telling you guys no like two or three times before finally I was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> okay, fine, let's do it. Yeah, I think, I think the size of that initial angular growth kind of caught everyone off guard like yeah yourself included right like you're like there's no need for an all angular podcast but then it's like obviously there is a need yeah and there's there's a need for an all angular conference and several of them even so yep. yeah i think it kind of caught us all off guard the same thing right now is happening with react right like it's just it's just exploding mm-hmm. and there's a need for all things react as well so so yeah yep absolutely and uh, yeah, it, it's really interesting to, to, to not only to see like where Angular and React are going as far as, uh, frameworks for web development, but also just all of the other places it's, they seem to be creeping into. And so you've got things like React, React Native or Native Script mm-hmm. with Angular. And so you can get onto mobile devices and, you know, some of these other, um, I, I don't know, quite know what to call them, like set top devices, I guess, where you've got like Apple TVs and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. you can compile native script or react native to those, um, mm-hmm. you know, and just, just stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's really just amazing. And yeah, no, nobody saw that coming. I didn't, but I mean, now it just makes, now you kind of expect it, right? Uh huh. There's Electron, there's Cordova, there's native yep. script, react native. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's everything you need to do. You can pretty much get it done in JavaScript. Yep. So, so, so what else have you done? I mean, we've talked about ng-conf, we've talked about the podcast, uh, your, you know, your time as a GDE. Well, what else have you done in JavaScript or Angular that you want to discuss? I think the one of the very first projects I ever worked on is still one of the coolest things I ever did. My twin bro, he, he was using this website for real estate and you had to like go to see if there was any new orders available. And if there weren't, you had to refresh after 10 seconds. And when you refresh, you had to put in a captcha. And then when you put it, once you typed in the captcha, it would show you if there were any new orders. And, and there's not, there's only like one new order an hour, 
Uh-huh. So to sit there and just refresh and type in captions for like hours is stupid, right? Right. It's stupid. So my brother was like, I want you to build a browser extension to solve captions so I don't have to do this anymore. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> like, I don't know how to parse letters out of an image like with JavaScript. It doesn't make any sense to me. But he's like, think about it. So I started slowly thinking about it. I was like, well, if I took the CAPTCHA and I put it into a canvas and I started doing some neighborhood calculations, I bet I could figure out what the letters are and then I could type those letters into the box and hit next. And before too long, I had built like a, a browser extension that would solve these CAPTCHAs on this site. And so we started marketing it to um, other people that use the same site my brother did. And that was one of the first things I ever did. And it was one of the funnest problems to solve, like busting a caption, like reading an image, like getting text out of an image. That's pretty, that's pretty advanced for a, a total noob. And, and it was something I had a lot of fun doing. Yep. Huh? Yeah. I, I think, uh, did you do a talk at one of the users groups or something on busting captures? Oh yeah. Cause I thought, oh, yeah. I thought, I, I think I remember sitting through something like that. That was one of the first things I ever did in the Utah JS group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah back when we were meeting in the, the Domo office that was just off the freeway over by, over in Orem. Yeah. Up in North Orem. Yeah. Yep. And there's like eight of us. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Man, that was a long time ago. That was now Utah JS is like two of them and there's like 80 people at each one. Yep. It's a big group now. Yeah, absolutely. So what are you working on these days? I have a little side project I'm working on, and uh, it's got a lot of WebRTC involved in it and a lot of WebSockets and Firebase. Um, it's fun. It's it's a remote communication app for remote teams, for remote workers. Um NGConf is always a challenge trying to figure out how to make it bigger and better each year. Um, if I know, I know you've been before Chuck, so you know, yeah. it's a pretty awesome event trying to make each year better than the year previous is a constant challenge. So I, I put a lot of time into that. And Joe Eames is absolutely amazing when it comes to NGConf. Like I get to MC it and a lot of people think Dave and I are the faces of the event, but Joe Eames is, is the amazing behind the scenes guy doing a lot of the work and stuff. So. We put a lot of time into that, and then I'm kind of chilling out on conference speaking, and I'm spending a lot more time being a dad right now. So awesome! That's what I'm doing most most of my time with. And then I'm a workaholic, so I I love working at Domo. I love getting a lot of code written, so I work voluntarily a lot of hours there because I really really like what we're doing, and I I care about about the mission that we have there, at Domo. So so yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So is is there some uh, overarching thing that you've learned over the last, you know, seven or so years of programming or 10 years or whatever? Um, I think the uh, uh, a thing that has been, it, it keeps recurring recently, is that um, there's a real need for engineers to focus more on solving problems for users Mm -hmm. and, and less on having perfect code. Right. And I think that a lot of some of the decisions I see is developers trying to make decisions to make perfect code that could potentially really, I mean, sink a company Mm -hmm. rather than just sticking on a technology that's not as beautiful as they want or, code that's ugly for all like argumentative purposes and just sticking with that and making sure that you're still solving the user problem. I think that we developers need to be more business focused rather than tech focused sometimes and, and focus more on solving business problems and making sure the business is, is as successful as possible and less on are we using the latest technologies do we have all the coolest patterns and practices implemented and stuff like that? So I think there's a lot of churn going on right now. There's a lot of chasing the pendulum. And I think that chasing the pendulum is a fool's errand and it's kind of childish. So I, I like to see people make more responsible decisions of solving, make, making your business profitable, solving problems for the end user. 
Yeah. I think that's the thing that that's really hit home for me and it keeps, it keeps recurring again and again recently. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, there's something to be said for writing great code, but great code serves the purpose of the business as well. As far as, you know, being maintainable and running well, running quickly and things like that. But a lot of times, yeah, we lose sight of that because we want to do the cool thing or the interesting thing or the, the, the tricky thing instead of doing the, you know, the thing that gets the job done. Yeah. And if we can, if we lose sight of what we're actually trying to serve, then a lot of times it's a mistake, even if we do it right. Yeah. Like a lot of, a lot of people right now are going to find themselves in a similar situation where they've got a lot of Angular JS code and they're going to have a lot of this new code, React mm-hmm. or Angular. And it's really easy to focus on getting rid of all the Angular JS, but is if it's still working, then you should still focus on still getting your company the competitive advantage and let that angular JS exist. And you keep like add new stuff, like yeah. keep providing new value. Don't try and replace the already existing value. That's that still works with new, uh, with a new you know version written in a new language. Like leave that there and write something new in your new language. Like, continue to provide as much value for your, your owners and your shareholders as possible and your end users. So yeah, and that's a big message. I would change the pendulums. Usually a waste of money. That's my, that's my opinion. Yep. No, I agree with you. And not always, but it usually is. So sometimes it's okay to be uncool for 18 months and let the (laughs) pendulum come back to you. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, do you have any picks to share with us? Have you ever felt like you're falling behind or that the programming world is moving so fast that it's impossible to keep up? Then there's the issue of where to go to make sure you're up to date. The answer is to join a community dedicated to discussing the latest in JavaScript. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you got JavaScript Jabber all day? Well, you can, kind of. We've created a Slack community for JavaScript Jabber. That means that you can connect with our listeners and guests on a platform you're most likely already using. Plus, we've set up a Keeping Current channel that pulls stories from across the web to help you know what people are talking about. And coming soon, we'll be holding monthly webinars and roundtable video chats to connect with experts in the community and with each other. So come join us at javascriptjabber.com slash slack. I've got a couple picks. Yeah, I've been, I've been reading a series of books. And I'm going to throw it out here. It's called Superpowers. And uh, it's a really good series. It's about um, a world where there's people with with powers, superpowers. Mm-hmm. And then they go to college for, to the hero certification program to become superheroes. And it's just kind of a story about this world where supers are real and supers like live out in the open and there's a hero certification program to become a superhero. And anyway, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the characters are really, really cool. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just kind of finishing up the fourth book in that series, but, but it's a lot of fun. So I'll leave that other superpowers. And as far as other picks, I don't really have any other picks. It's all good. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to toss out a couple of picks here myself. Um, okay. the first one is a system that I've been using as a CRM. It is a CRM. Um, but, uh, I've kind of gone through the CRM dance. Um, I might've picked this on the last episode. I don't remember. Anyway, if you're hearing it again, sorry. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I went, I've gone through probably six or seven CRMs, including Salesforce. Um, and then probably some that you may or may not have heard of contactually 17 hats. Um, and I hated them all, <laughs> really. Um, but I'm using one now called Nimble, and that's at nimble.com, and it's got a Chrome plugin and a bunch of other stuff, and it just makes it really easy to find information about people. So, hmm. for example, um, right now I have an email that's, you know, my computer's on, so I have an email open um, for a friend of mine, Mike Tabor, um, who built Bluetick, bluetick.io, which is another, it's an email automation system, which I'll also pick. Um, but anyway, so, um, the first time his, his thing came up, his profile came up, it showed me all of this stuff about him. So, 
um, I could just say, yes, that's him. And then it would add all of the information from LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. Mm. And, um, you know, I can go look at his profile in Nimble and it will, um, it'll actually, um, tell me, you know, news. So I, you know, it kind of pulls stuff off of those social networks and, you know, gives me information. So if I wanted to reach out to him, I could, you know, let's say he's a big sports fan or something, you know, I could reach out to him and say, Hey, you know, the, you know, Real Salt Lake, I know he's not a fan of Real Salt Lake, but you know, I could say, Hey, Real Salt Lake, blah, blah, blah is awesome. And, uh, you know, or, Hey, I noticed you're a fan of this, you know, this, uh, sports team and I could send him like a mug or something. Uh, right, right. But, but yeah, so it's, it's been really helpful that way. And then it doesn't try to pretend to be this email automation system, which I was looking for. And so I use a blue tick for that. And, uh, anyway, it works really nicely. Uh, most of the automation in, can, or in blue tick actually, um, besides sending out email sequences and timing, uh, just works through Zapier, which is also really nice. So cool. since I'm using that anyway, it's, it's really solid. Besides that, I ran into, uh, I, I've been kind of playing with VS Code off and on, and I'm cool. really digging it. So I'm going to pick ver, uh, Visual Studio Code as well. Um, we interviewed Wade Anderson and, I can't remember her name, but we had another engineer um, that we interviewed at Build, Microsoft Build, and they talked about what's coming up in that, and that's really exciting. So I'm going to pick that as well. And uh, yeah, um, lots of cool stuff going on out there in the world of JavaScript, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'll also mention that uh, Zapier is what I use to power the um, keeping current rooms that I have in the Slack channels. So I'm setting up okay. Slack rooms for JavaScript Jabber and Adventures in Angular, and people can just join. I think I'm charging a $10 per month fee, and that's mostly so that I can pay speakers to come and talk to us about whatever they've got going on. Gotcha. Uh, it, it's just easier to get people in and, you know, give them something for showing up. But yeah, it's... I just use Zapier, and I pull off of, like, Reddit, and I, I pull off of a handful of other places, and just, you know, just get all that information in there. So I can pull off of RSS feeds, so we can pull off of JavaScript Jabber and if there are any other podcasts, blogs, etc. It's it's really great. So anyway, just some interesting stuff there. Can I actually throw out a few more picks while you were talking? I thought of two picks I want to throw out. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this one, it's probably already been picked, but I I barely started using it and I absolutely love it. And it's Yarn. Uh-huh. Um, I've been going through a lot of like old branches and stuff. So I have to constantly remove my node modules and re npm install, and that normally takes about eighty or ninety seconds. But with Yarn, it's like fourteen seconds. So Yarn is like saving my life. And if you haven't used it, it's awesome. Apparently, npm five is going to have a lot of these uh, Yarn speed improvements built in native. But f- for now, um, Yarn is is amazing and. It, it it works with your package that JSON, like literally you just install it. And then the next time you do NPM install, just do yarn and it will, it will take place. It's amazingly fast. I think it's totally awesome. So yarn is a, is a pick of mine. And then also, um, I started implementing my own home automation system. Oh, I've been I'm, wanting to do that for a long time. Yeah. And I'm using Samsung smart things as the platform. And Samsung Smart Things is so awesome. Um, it's and it's got a whole ton of like just devices that exist in its ecosphere. So if you want switches for your light switches or a camera or um, a water sensor or a motion detector or a movement detection thing for like your doors if they open and close, there's all the devices already exist, and um, and and you can just hook them up to the app and then your smart, your smart things hub, you can like automate through it. Like it's just, and it's just like, a, it's just like clicking buttons. Like after 10 PM, if there's motion, don't turn the light on in my bedroom because that means I don't want to turn the light on in the middle of the night. Right. But during the daytime, turn the light on with motion and turn it off after five minutes of no motion. So that my lights don't stay on all day long. You know right. what I'm saying? Uh huh. And so, and it's really easy to do all that kind of automation. Like it, you just like, Tap, 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 and you got the rules all set up, and your house is automated. And you can automate your front doors and your garage doors and your lights for your front porch or for, for anything. Yeah, so I'm going to pick Samsung Smart Things. 
um, for the smart things, home automation stuff. Nice. Yeah. Man, I, I've been wanting to get involved in that kind of thing for a while. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So if people want to get a hold of me, you were asking? Yeah, if people want to follow you on Twitter or Facebook or GitHub or wherever wherever you tend to have the most up-to-date and interesting information, maybe a blog, where do they go? Yeah. So I've got um, I've got JS underscore dev on Twitter. Uh-huh. I've got Frosty on Medium, and I don't really do a lot there. And then I've got on GitHub Aaron Frost. And there's an AMA there if anyone wants to go. I haven't done too much with it, but if you want to ask any questions, my AMA on Git is a good place to go file an issue. But so yeah, that's how you get a hold of me. I open up my direct messages on Twitter, so anyone pretty much can DM me. Um, so yeah, that's how you would get a hold of me. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you for coming and talking to us. Um, we'll, we'll get this out on the feed and uh, we'll talk to everyone next week. Yep. Thanks, Chuck. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.